The car's out of control. Maynard Troyer's Ford number 60 flips an incredible number of times. And we've got trouble on turn number four. Car number 30 is upside down. That's Walter Ballard's car. Buddy Baker also involved. Ballard's car coming to rest right side up. We hope he's okay. Walter Ballard from Texas, the rookie last year, and he looks as though he's climbing out. An engine in turn number two here at Texas World Speedway. Fostino has blown an engine. He has spun down the backstretch. One car going upside down. Tiny Lund comes into it. As the work continues on these automobiles, and they have brought in Richard Childress' car. Let's go to Fritz Duda. They just pulled the Childress car, the blue uh, 1971 Chevelle with the big orange gold letters, number 96 on it. As it uh, is pulled behind the tow truck, we can observe it now. The whole front end is sandwiched up. Uh, the top top of the car crunched in, the uh, front of the car really bearing no resemblance to a car at all as they pull it uh, back in behind the garages now uh, with a white tow truck pulling it off. They pretty well got the track back in condition over there now, Ken. They have had uh, cement and sand uh, uh, splattered all over the inside there where Faustino let go. And uh, Dick Childress, a very uh, lucky young man as we view his automobile coming into the garage now. Back to radio control. Richard Childress, number 96, is almost back to the garage area, which will finish its trip today. It's a sad way to finish it. The tower, this is Jerry Smith in the pits, and I have right now with me Richard Childress, who had the accident on the other side of the course, turn two. Richard, first of all, the most important question, how are you? I'm okay, a little bit sore right now. How did the thing happen, Richard? Well, Doc had been smoking for about five or six laps, Pat, and I knew he was going to blow. And I was just trying to get around it before he did, and uh, Another, when he blew, another car, I think it was Raymond or somebody, you know, sort of came down in front of me, and I just spun the car to miss him. And when I did, I hit a cover, and the car just started flipping. Bobby Allison, number 16, the master, leads his 26-year-old protege, Neil Bonnet, number 12, by less than a car length. But on the back stretch, Richard Brooks rides one down hard. As safety crews move to the tattered remains of another race car, we see in slow motion what happens when a 3,700-pound automobile hurtles out of control at 190 miles per hour. Everything on the car broken from that wrenching series of vicious sidewinder rolls except for the mandatory roll cage to protect the driver. Unbelievably, Richard Brooks, after washing off the Alabama red clay, was back in the pits regaling crewmen with a ride of his life story. And the next day, he played 18 holes of golf. Bobby was, I think he just thought that he had passed the car and he pulled up on him and maybe the car had gotten off the turn a little bit better than he did. Uh, you got to be very aware of that, that you're not not cutting the guy too short because some guys just won't lift and let you go, you know, and some of them all kind of hold you tight. 
because everybody is anxious and on a restart from a caution, you have all the cars bunched up. And if one car makes one slight error, then that causes something that happened to Allison. When they uh, took Allison out of the automobile, other than being sh you know, shooken up and bruised up a little bit, he was ready to go home. I didn't think he'd ever make it. I was watching him in Will Cronkite's car in Atlanta, and he turned over in the infield. I remember saying, if that kid ever makes it right there, the woods are full of them. One of the defining moments was at Atlanta when he went over, knocked himself out, and he got out and he was looking for a ride by the end of the day. He did not want to go back to the dirt tracks. He wanted to stay in NASCAR Winston Cup racing. Yeah, he was out of control, but desperate people will do desperate things. I must tell you that I have seen Bruce in another accident similar to this, as bad, at Charlotte, North Carolina. He went end over end about nine times several years ago, was badly injured, and at that time retired. But he has wanted to come back, got an opportunity here, and at the last moment, had an opportunity to get in this race. Ned Bruce Jacoby is one of the drivers that a lot of fans like to be around and like to see. Some may say that Bruce Jacoby over the years has been one of the guys who has filled out the field, but he's always been very loyal and very dedicated to the sport of automobile racing. He was involved in the transition a few years back in IndyCar racing when they went from the front engine to the rear engine cars. He's tried for quite a number of years to qualify for the Indianapolis 500-mile race up north, but never succeeded. His first love in recent years has been down here in the south running stock cars, but he has always remained his, kept his ties to the north. He's very closely aligned with the Potter family back home in Indianapolis where the three Potter boys, or all three brothers, run actively in the USAC midget division. But Bruce Jacoby has been trying very, very desperately to get into this Daytona 500 field for the last three or four seasons. No defensive unit, no offensive unit, no taxi squad to put in out here. Bonnet is first. A.J. Foyt, 1972, Daytona 500 champion, has come to second. Remember a year ago, Foyt flipping six, seven times down here in turn number one, side over side. He's back just as tough, just as strong, just as great as ever. Probably the greatest driver of our time in America. Now we're going to see in slow-mo another time what happened. Here they are.